one of the micro skills is the power of intrigue. And that's what's going on right now for you, Boris, is that I've intrigued you because you're naturally curious to want to know. Well, I've told you, look down the camera, I've told you intrigue. So you're now thinking, well, what are the other 61 skills? Hey there, and welcome to yet another episode of the World of Presentations podcast brought to you by us, Presentation Agency 256 Labs. I'm Boris, the founder of the company and your host for this episode. And today we have someone who really focuses on virtual presentations. Rob Garrity is the founder of Presenting Virtually. And today I expect him to drop a ton of knowledge that can help you prepare and deliver truly effective virtual presentations. Rob, welcome to the podcast. And before I start bombarding you with cool questions, uh, let us know more about you. Yeah. Hi, Boris. Great to be here. And uh, yeah, I'm delighted to to share some thoughts with you about presenting virtually, because I guess this is the reality that everyone's facing right now, isn't it? That uh, uh, so many people are having to take what they did face to face and having to do it virtually. And I guess our view, Boris, is it's just not the same. You know, there is a a new skill set that we talk about. I'm not saying that there's, you know, you can forget everything from the past, but you've got to use some new skills and there's plenty that is different about virtual presenting that uh, that people need to keep in mind. Okay, so how did you, before we jump into all of the tips and tricks and the advices and the practical things, how did you get into the presentation industry? Because nobody in our industry gets into the industry by saying, yeah, I'm going to be a presentation person, you know? So yeah. What was your journey to the presentation world? Well, it, uh, my journey is interesting because, um, so if I go back to thinking about the first time I ever gave a presentation at school, I used to have to stand up when I was at like 17, 18, I'd stand up at school in front of the whole school and I had to read out the, the, the sports results for, for all the teams. And I hated it. And I used to go bright red to such an extent that one of my nicknames was Beetroot. People would call me Beetroot at school because I hated it so much. Um, But look, later on in my career after university, um, in in my uh, second job at at Vodafone, I was working for Vodafone, the mobile telco here in the UK. And I had to present, you know, when I was there in my role. And I also got the opportunity to go to some conferences. And to go and represent Vodafone, I went to one in South Africa, I went to one in Bangkok. And I remember the South African one, I came off the stage, this is an industry conference for the telco uh, industry. I came off the stage and the conference organizer said, wow, that was great. You're clearly very experienced at doing this. And I said, well, no, this is the first conference presentation I've ever done. And that was the first time that I actually sort of thought, oh, oh, actually, I'm quite good at this presenting thing. And then informally, it wasn't my day job. My day job was in product management at Vodafone. Um, People would come to me and say, Rob, oh, you're good at presenting. Can you help me prepare? I've got an important presentation coming up. I'm going to see this customer. I'm going to see the board. And it wasn't my day job, but I sat there in the restaurant in the Vodafone HQ campus in Newbury in the UK, and I would help people with their presentations. And I started to say, do you know what? I enjoy this way more than my day job as a product manager. So when I left Vodafone, this is, I don't know, 2004, 2005, something like that. I basically said, look, I'm leaving because I just want to focus on helping people uh, get better at presentations. And what that meant was over the, over the years, I did a lot of skills training and how to be a, a better presenter. Um, but in, interestingly, of course, the more you do that, the more interested you get. And therefore, the more you learn, you can read about what other people are doing and you just get more and more skilled at doing that. So, gosh, over those 15 years, I, I've sat with so many, must be in the thousands of presenters that I've sat with and helped them to design, craft, deliver, you know, really good presentations. So is for sure that's related to the company presenting virtually because that's the name of the company. But can you tell us a little bit about the company itself also? Like, what are you guys specialized in? What can people reach out to when we talk about, like, what, what are you guys doing there? Yeah, well, and I guess we, we believe there's a whole new skill set that people don't have for virtual presentations. And, just, and, and, you know, we put this together in a framework of micro skills. And the reason why we call them micro skills is because 
they're really small and bite-sized and they're relatively easy to, to, to get the idea and to be able to then apply. But people haven't thought about them. And I'm just going to give you one as an example of these 63. And that's the idea about where we look. We all know that when we're in the room with people, we need to look at our audience and make eye contact with them. But when we're virtual, how does that work? And what most people do is that they look at the screen. They look at the people on the screen. But if we want to connect with people virtually, we need to look down the camera. And those are two totally separate things. But then what we see is that actually, if you do look down the camera, the amazing thing is, if you had an audience of 1,000 people and you look down the camera, each one of them feels like you're talking directly to them. So what you're effectively doing is you're giving eye contact to 1,000 people at the same time. And this is where you start to go, oh, actually, the virtual experience can be better than what I could have done face to face. So look, I, I'm just picking one here, Boris, one example of, of, of a micro skill. And as I say, we think there's 63 of these things that if people really want to deliver virtually at the top of their game, they need to get better at. And you are helping them with those 63 yeah, look, we're sharing a lot of this in, in training. So where we're working in-house in large organizations where they're saying, look, well, a great example, we're working in a pharmaceutical company. They've just rang us up just this morning. They said uh, our senior directors are going to be delivering uh, at a conference. The conference is over three days and they're all accomplished presenters who are used to standing on the stage. But all of a sudden they've got to do it virtually this year. So can you come and run some emergency training to give them some of those quick tips that they need to apply. And, you know, we've only got three hours with those eight individuals, but in three hours, we're gonna give them some of the emergency toolkit that will get them through this event. Now, what we also need to do is share with them a whole load of other stuff that I think will really benefit them. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's just, you know, that training, that coaching, but also then helping people look at the slides that they're producing and then rehearsing well. So few people rehearse well for a, for an important presentation. So did you, have you, I have, this is the first time, by the way, I'm hearing that you kind of codify it in some way, like 63, yeah. there is this magical number now. Like, have you written those down? Have you, are you planning to, I don't know, maybe make a book out of it? I, like, because when you, when, when I hear that it's, kind of has a number on it it makes me say okay i want to know those 63 things like what are those yeah well because you know and, but yeah. but what, and one of the skills one of the micro skills is the power of intrigue and that's what's going on right now for you boris is that i've intrigued you because you're naturally curious to want to know well i've told you look down the camera i've told you intrigue so you're now thinking well what are the other 61 skills exactly and, and and again but it's a technique that we can use in our presentations and we can use it in our virtual presentations of promising something but not actually saying what it is and that will draw our audience in so now yeah. i know three of them <laughs> now you've got two of them you've got two you've got you've got intrigue and you've got look down the camera so yeah, if we're here until the end of the day, maybe we'll get through them all. So, okay, um, but you see, but you're absolutely the idea of codifying it and putting it into a structure. And you know, there's certain sections in there. So we've got. Um, I'll just quickly run through them. So we we talk about um, the biggest topic is audience engagement. So okay. this is the topic where I find most people we're talking to right now are saying, "Yeah, but how do I engage people who are not in the same room as me?" That is the big question that people come with. They also then say. How do I read how it's going? Because again, when we were in the room, we could get a sense, we could get a feeling of, are people switched off? Are people switched on? Um, is this working? But people say that they really struggle with that virtually. Um, so audience engagement, big topic. We also talk, the other second big topic is virtual presence. So this is all about how you show up and the presence and impact that you have. So looking down the camera, for example, is one of the micro skills from virtual presence. Um, then we talk about embrace the technology. And I guess so many people just go, well, hey, I can switch teams on, I can hit share slides, but we think a good virtual presentation is so much more than that. So it's about you know considering what other technology is out there that you can bring in and you can use. You know, you can use the all of the polling software to get your audience voting and again, We've seen a massive rise of that. All of that was out there, 
before, but it's only now we've gone virtual. And then the final two things are one is the mindset. So having the right mindset for virtual delivery, because I've, we find that so many people focus on what they've lost uh, and the fact that I can't shake people's hands now, or I can't look them in the eye, or I can't walk up close to them. But actually, there's so much that you can gain from virtual delivery. Uh, and then the last thing that we talk about is how people use slides in, uh, in virtual delivery as well. So if we get from, like, if we have to start from the last one that you mentioned, let's say the slides, what is the, what are one or two things that you, you either see people do wrong or you advise them to kind of change in their mindset, change in the way they approach it? Let's start yeah. with the slides. Let's say. So let's start with the slides and let's start with two things in there. So first of all, don't share the slides all of the time. So what we see is that people go, okay, I'm going to start my presentation now. They hit share screen and then they leave those slides on all of the time. So again, go back to the face-to-face -face world. One of the things that I would have done all of the time is I would have pressed B on my keyboard to make the screen go black or on my clicker. And then the slides have gone off and I'm focused more on the audience and the engagement with the audience that I'm talking to. So I would have done that regularly when I was face-to-face. -face. <clears throat> But what I'm seeing is that people are, are just leaving those slides on all of the time. Now, if you're using a platform like Microsoft Teams, the slides then go really big and the video feed goes very small. So, so we're losing the human connection. So what I'm encouraging you to do is, I'm not saying don't have any slides. I believe in good quality slides, but use the slide when you need to use it. And if you're not using it and it's not helping anymore, let's just stop sharing screen and go back to the people to people and looking people in the eye and having the conversation. Um, so one of our one of those micro skills is actually don't share the screen, as in don't do it all of the time. Um, so that's the first thing, and and I think on Microsoft Teams that's particularly a bad experience because it makes the slides go so big and the video is so small. Um, and then the second thing I'd say about slides is is just you know, people were making bad slides anyway, weren't they? And Boris, you know this because I'm sure lots of the slides that come into your agency. You know, they're bad in the first place and you that's what you do. You make them better. But, you know, just taking those really bad slides and sticking them up. And especially you think about that scenario I've just talked about where you've got teams where the slides go really big. Well, all of a sudden, people are looking at the slides even more than they're looking at you. So I almost think it's even more important now that, that we've got well-designed, professionally produced slides. Um, I think they're just crucial. Yeah. Slides are a big deal, obviously, nowadays. They have been, as you said, they have been a big deal. Not that many people were realizing it, but now when it's virtual and when they take 90% of the screen of the audience, it seems like it, it makes sense for you to kind of say, wait a minute, I really need to improve my game here because if they are taking so much space and this is more or less the main thing that people see, it better be something good, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so if it is going to be the main thing that people are going to see, then we've got to make it good. But also let's not be frightened of switching them off and coming back to the people bit and the conversation. Um, and, you know, and I see so many times when we show a slide and then, you know, the whole idea is that we have a discussion and it leads to some sort of conversation. Well, you know, we maybe don't need the slide on. So just, just get it off and then, and then you can bring it back up again. So there's absolutely no problem with doing that. So you said that people are struggling a lot and asking a lot about, for example, engagement, right? This is obviously a big topic in many, many organizations. Our customers are also like, how do I know? How can I keep them engaged? You are also experiencing this with all of your customers. Like, what are you guys advising your customers? What are the top things that you tell them? Hey, try this, try that and see how it works. Yeah. Um, And why do I say engagement? Why do I know that? Well, the reason is because when we, we once every two weeks on a Monday, uh, we run a free introduction session just to come and meet us, meet the team, see the work that we're doing. And we always ask at the start of that, what's the biggest challenge about presenting virtually? And we get people to chat the answers in. And I would say 50% of the things that people chat in use that word engagement and audience engagement. So... What, what do we encourage people to do to, to, to engage? Well, the principle that I want to share comes from 
the mindset section of the framework. <clears throat> and the principle is to involve your audience early and often. So I think with a virtual presentation, even more than with a face-to-face -face presentation, and I would have been arguing this if we were talking about face-to-face -face presentations, I'd have still said, involve your audience. Now I'm saying do it more, but do it early and often. So what do I mean by early? Um, so again, uh, that example I've just shared, we, we start up that session at two o'clock. At 2.03 p.m., we are asking our audience to all chat in what their biggest challenge is. And then straight away, having, you know, with 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 chat comments in there, we then go to the people. And we go and say, Boris, you wrote in there that you're struggling with making better slides. Explain what you mean by that. We hear from Boris. Then we go to Mary. Then we go to Steve. Then we go to John. So what we do in the first 10 minutes is we get the audience involved and participating in the presentation. I guess the whole mindset behind this is also it's moving away from broadcast, moving away from talking at the audience to a presentation is something that we do with the audience, that we involve them, we hear their views. Um, so, um, so it's about involving them uh, early and often. Does that make sense, what I'm saying to you, uh, Boris? <laughs> Absolutely. I was about to ask, when, especially for an example like this, where you have 100 people, let's say, in a Zoom call or whatever, do you advise your customers to also appoint or bring in a moderator to help them out with all of those comments? Because I can imagine that when you have, like, let's say, 100 people just typing in the chat and you are the speaker, it's kind of tricky, right? Yeah, it's absolutely. kind of tricky for you. To... So, so again, there's a whole section of the of the uh, of the framework which is all about co-hosting and co-presenting. Mm -hmm. So again, one of the things with virtual, and it's one of the things that's just all of a sudden really possible with virtual is co-delivery. And you should not be if if you've got a hundred people in your audience, there is absolutely no way that you should be delivering on your own. And different ways that you can do that. So one could be co-delivery. So for example, Boris, you and I, we both know about presentations. So we could go and co-deliver together. I might do the section about audience engagement, then you might do the section about slides. So we can co-deliver. The other way of doing it is um, you could come in and you could be the host for me who, and again, I, I get frustrated. Hosts are often just go, oh, I'm here to host the session today. Uh, Boris is our guest, over to you, Boris. That's not hosting. Hosting is a very active process who, you know, the, the host needs to jump in, engage, represent the audience, stop the presenter, interrupt the presenter to make the whole thing seem more dynamic. Um, which, you know, I guess it's, you know, similar to what we're doing here, Boris. You know, if this was just me talking, this wouldn't be as interesting as putting your voice in and asking the questions and jumping in and jumping out. Yeah, that change in the way the podcast in this case is delivered is bringing interest and engagement itself right but, but your your voice sounds so different to mine that that just perks everybody up you know that Absolutely. You know, the listeners today will get fed up of listening to me but they'll get fed up of listening to you but the fact that we jump in and jump out creates dynamism and that creates involvement yeah so i guess come back to the the principle i should have involved early and often and the whole idea is if we do that well, people are, people are just listening more and they're just more engaged. They're, they're just, it sounds more dynamic. I mean, I guess, again, presentations, they need to move away from being monologues, one person talking. And I take a lot of inspiration from, from radio, from TV. You know, we don't see TV programs these days with just one presenter. You know, it's about having a number of different presenters. Um, Again, for, for your global viewers, these names might not make any sense, but people in the UK would recognize Ant and Deck. They're a pair of TV presenters. You never see Ant on his own. It's only Ant and Deck together. And it's the dynamic between the two of them that makes um, them good TV. So, um, yep. Yeah. So, um, Boris, can I share one more uh, very specific tip? Go uh, ahead, please. Which, again, it, it's tied into this involvement thing. So, the very specific micro skill is the micro skill that we call first name first so again what i see so many people want to involve their audience so so many people so far would go yeah i agree with everything rob's saying but then when they actually come to do it they don't do it 
and they might say to the audience, I want to make it really involving today and really engaging and really get you involved. But then they talk at the audience and then they think, OK, let's try and get the audience involved. And they go, well, what does anybody think about what I've said? And yeah. it goes silent and they go, anybody, anybody help me out here. And then three people jump in at once and speak. So then we've got a mess. So this is where the technique of first name first comes in. So as the presenter, what I will do is I will signpost who I want to speak to. So I'm going to say, uh, we've been talking about what, what's, a, what's a healthy breakfast, Boris. So I'd like to hear from some of you in our audience today about what you've had for breakfast this morning. So Boris, I'm going to come to you with this question. And then Mary, I'm going to come to you. Can you share with us what you had for breakfast? Boris, let's start with you. So yeah. do you see what I'm doing, Boris, with this first name first? Yeah, absolutely. You more or less put a, something like a frame and you restrict everyone who was not called by name to unmute themselves and make the mess that otherwise can happen. Absolutely. And and the reason why, why, why because again, it's really easy to go, um, what, did, uh, what do you think about Einstein's theory of relativity, Boris? And poor Boris is on the spot here. And he goes, oh, sorry, uh, I lost the connection there, which means he wasn't listening. Yeah. So, again, the reason why we go first name right at the front is that that sort of wakes up that individual. And then we put the question. Actually, before the question, we often do some filler. So we often say, for example, Boris, I'm going to come to you with this next question. Now, that bit there, that I'm going to come to you, that was just filler content. Yeah. Then I said the question, what did you have for breakfast? And then what I'm also doing is always signposting the second person. So let's say I've now heard from you, Boris. I'm now going to go to Mary. And when I go to Mary, I say, oh, and we're going to come to you now, Mary. And then we're going to come to Stephen. So I'm always signposting where I'm going to go next. Now, look, even if you haven't been chosen, you haven't been brought in in this way. I still feel as though you feel when you're in the audience that, well, the audience, we as the people on the listeners have been represented um and i think it also does keep people on their toes that well he might come to me next and i'm not doing this in a sort of you know school teacher way that i'm going to put you on the spot and make a fool of you boris it's just like well look, i, I want to hear from you of course i mean that is something that's what we were planning for meaning that's what we were aiming at in regards to it in regards to really practical advices, right? That is as practical as it gets. Now, in regards to the virtual presentations, many, most, I would say, people are presenting from them from their homes. For those, of, for those people for whom the presentations are super important or their roles just require their presentations to be on a top level, do you advise them to, what are the advices for them to set up properly in their home? Like, what do you include in there? What are you asking them to try and do? Obviously, not every single time, every single advice can be applied because of the apartment or because of the house or because of the place they live in. But what is, yeah. what's going on in there? And, that, and this is all the stuff that's in the, the section called virtual presence, you know, is sort of where, where do we start? Well, first of all, we, we talk about building a Zoom zone. And look, I say Zoom zone, but other platforms are available. Yeah. It's just that it just works well as a name Zoom zone. But people get it. And it's the idea of what's going on behind you outside of that shot. And um, and look, we've got to curate this. You know, you can't just switch the camera on and just, you know, anything's in the background. Um, because people do get distracted by that stuff and they're thinking, why, why is there a, you know, why is that there? So, so I want you to create that and, and look at what's in the background there. Um, one thing that, you know, people often do is they often go quite plain with that background. They go against a plain wall. And I just think that's too, it's too boring. It doesn't place you anywhere. It looks, it almost looks like you're in prison sometimes if there's just a plain wall behind you. So, I want to have something behind you and something of interest. So I always remember there was a lady came on a call recently. I'd never met her before, but there was a picture of a mountain in the background. So I said to her, I said, oh, you know, is that is that Mount Everest? It was just a guess. And she turns around and says, yeah, it's Mount Everest. And she starts telling me about her passion for climbing. 
Uh, and then she tells me about the other photograph, which is in the UK. It's the Lake District. But what happened was that created connection. So one, one of the skills we talk about when we're hosting is actually the idea of say what you see. So when somebody arrives into your, your room, your virtual room, say something about what you can see in the background. Be that, you know, oh, what's that photograph there? Or, you know, I can see that there's a, there's a toy elephant there. You know, I once remember asking my colleague David years ago, he's got this wooden penguin in the background. And, you know, I said to him, well, what's that? But he starts telling me the story about how he went to Chile and, uh, you know, he was traveling in Chile and he bought this wood carving. And I said, I went to Chile as well. So it brings us together. So I think you've got to curate something in the background. Um, last tip I'll give on this one. Um, Boris, I once talked to somebody who went really far with this, with the curation in the background. And he had a picture in the background of uh, the Liverpool football team. It was a calendar with the Liverpool football team because he was obviously clearly a Liverpool fan. But he told me that when he goes to see certain customers who are Manchester United fans, he changes it for the Manchester mm -hmm. United calendar. So <laughs> That's knowing your audience. It's knowing your audience. And again, you know, I mean, it's just really what a practical idea of knowing your audience. Or, you know, I've worked with trainers and they've, they've had some books in the background. If you're teaching about emotional intelligence, put the emotional intelligence books there. If next day we're doing customer service, well, put the customer service books there. So, um, you know, I think you can curate that background. Yeah. Background is obviously one of the big, the big things. And people are, the last time I heard something that really impressed me, I would say, not impressed me, but called me thinking, you know, on virtual backgrounds was from a Hollywood producer. I don't know his name and I don't know why he was asked in first place to talk about this virtual presenting communication thing. But he said that what, what surprises him most is how how people don't care about the backgrounds that they have. Mm. And he asked the interviewer, hey, like, imagine an old, imagine the favorite moment in one of your, in, the, in a movie, like the favorite moment of the best movie out there, like anything, just imagine that moment in the movie. And then they, and then he questioned and said, asked and said, uh, do you think that there was something that was in that frame that was a coincidence? Yeah. Like, do you really think? And that he drove a point to say, hey, the background and everything that's in the frame is there for a reason. Yeah. Right? Why are people just presenting this way? And why are they just communicating and not caring about what's in the frame yeah. when it should be there for a reason? This, and, and, uh, and Boris, almost, this is my frustration is, presentations are not taken professionally oh you know, yeah. when, when i talk about presentation i'm talking about people in business that are doing presentations that could be sales people that could be the finance people that could be you know people internally and you know we can make our own slides and we can stand up and look i know everybody can talk and everyone can open powerpoint but that's not doing it professionally and if you've got great slides and you've really designed the experience that you want your audience to have and you've planned where you're going to involve them and you've thought about it all and it takes a long time and that's probably one of the major barriers is that most people have got a day job and then they've got to do this presentation but I think there's some really simple things that people could do to to, to make things better so um so coming back to our, this idea of background and the zoom zone as we call it Boris the whole idea for us is that that you create a zone, you create an area, um, and you know that the camera is pointing here and that you know that it's good what people are seeing. And look, the reality is that you can have all sorts of rubbish. And, you know, in my previous office, I've got the coats in there from the children. We've got the lunch plate half eaten. That's all somewhere else, but it's not in the shot. And therefore, you know, I can trust that this zone that I've set up is the Zoom zone. And I'm always safe to use that. So, um, you know, we shouldn't be thinking about it every single time that we're presenting. Yeah. What about video and mic? If 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 you have to decide on, you have the money, let's say that you are like, okay, I will improve. <laughs> I will figure out the background, but I need, and I have money, let's say, only to buy one of those two. Yeah. Is it the video or is it the mic? No, it's the microphone. The you must buy an external microphone. 
And um, I, don't, I don't know how this has come across on the podcast, but let's try it now. I'm going to change microphone so you can hear me let's right see. now. I am now going to change microphone. You can still hear me, Boris, but w- what's the difference at your end to what you hear? It's, it's huge. And, and now I'm back here and, you know, I just sound like I've got more gravitas, more authority, more passion. You can hear all of that in my voice. And, you know, I often say to clients, I say, well, you can spend £2,000 and we'll do some vocal coaching with you or go out and spend £100 on an external USB microphone. And this is hardly top of the range type stuff. You know, it's just something that's going to make it a lot better. And the difference that you've just heard at your end. um, But what's interesting, and there's also something really interesting about what we've just done there, that little experiment I did, is that you heard the difference. Now, at my end, I did not sound any different. So there's a lot of things that happen in virtual presentations that at my end, I don't see the difference. But what I've got to understand is what's the impact at your end? You know, but again, that's going back to the audience and putting the audience first. Yeah, so microphone, I, your reaction, because people won't be seeing the video. But when I asked the question, your reaction, I didn't even finish the question. You were like, microphone, microphone. Yeah, <laughs> like, because it's, 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 a, it's, yeah, it's guaranteed. So but I want you to go buy a, a better, you know, an external webcam, a, you know, a, a, a DSLR camera, you know, for some people, even using their mobile phone yeah. as the camera would be a step up from the inbuilt camera that's on, on the laptop. So, um, yeah, people, by the way, are recycling old iPhones as web cameras, yeah. like just saying, wait a minute, I have this iPhone seven or eight in my basement, wait a minute, let me pull that, like, let me bring that in. And if I use the camera that's on the back, the, <laughs> that camera is just so much better than the webcam. Yeah, because there's, the, there's those webcams where some people have these webcams in, in laptops. And you can understand, if you think about it, you think about a laptop manufacturer and they're making their thing and they put the money into the, the RAM and all of the stuff in the inside. And then they put a keyboard on it and they put a screen on it. And then they go, oh, we've got to put a camera in here. Uh, you know, oh gosh, we don't want to spend too much on this. So we've got a $10 camera we could put in there. So it's not going to be very good, is it? And it was never made for, for the reality that we're facing right now. So, so I think at minimum, an external webcam is, is really useful. Yeah, um, it's absurd, but- by the way. Even the, even the latest machines, even from Microsoft and from Apple, are just, okay, Microsoft are probably doing a little bit better right? Because they're full HD cameras. But the fact that Apple are still releasing the new Macs with 720p cameras is just funny. Mm. I mean, these are expensive machines. Like, as you said, like these are, these cameras cost 10 bucks. <laughs> I mean, that yeah. is, that's just not fair. But, you know, and again, you, you, you contrast this with all, you know, I mean, that, the expenditure here, you know, on a camera, on a microphone, you know, on this kit really, you know, and it always depends, doesn't it, Boris? Because if if presenting is something that I do, you know, once a quarter, well, that's very different. Whereas if, you know, if I'm working in sales and I've got to pitch for business three times a day, well, this stuff matters. Um, and I guess it depends how good you want to be. But, you know, you start doing this stuff. And I totally think you can differentiate yourself from your competition. Um, and, you know, the vast majority of people aren't doing this stuff, Boris. Like, and they're going in with their bad slides as well. So, um even if you only did half this stuff, I think you can stand out and be better than the competition. I completely agree. And on the hardware point, the webcams and all of those microphones and stuff, I also try to remind people that, hey, don't forget that if you invest in this, you're going to reuse that technology for years ahead. Like video cams and microphones, the technology behind it doesn't change that often. So the fact that you can invest whatever you're going to invest now and get those things, you are going to not just differentiate, but you're going to be differentiating yourself for the next few years because we know that almost no one will do that, right? (laughs) That is is the funny part also. Comparing to something else like, I don't know, mobile processors or anything else that changes each year, video cams are just video cams. It's full HD or 4K and that's it. And it will be full HD or 4K for the next five years. Like no one will jump to 8K and 8K will never become, it won't become the, the new standard, the new default in the next five years. Yeah. It just won't happen. It's not how it goes. Yeah. 
Boris, can I suggest one yeah. other thing for, for people? You were talking about people presenting from home and just mm. a, an option that I see so rarely used. And again, so much of what we share with people, we, we, we've gone back to thinking, okay, what would you have done face-to-face? -face? And then how do you bring that virtual? And here's another example. What do most people do? They sit down and deliver their presentation. Now, I ask people, if you were going to see this customer and you were going to go and present and there was 30 people in the room, what would you do? Sit down or stand up? Stand up. Stand up is what they always say. So <laughs> you're now delivering this presentation virtually. Why do you sit down? Well, it's on my computer. My computer's at a desk and there's a chair in front of my desk. So it's like people haven't thought about it. And, you know, and then people say, oh, but I don't want to go and spend £500 on a sit-stand desk. And I'm just like, well, you know, come on, go and get some big, thick books, you know, your, your big, thick dictionary and um, things like that. And you yeah, can raise boxes. the level of your, even if it is your laptop that you're still working with. But again, the, the, the micro scale is stand and deliver. Um, and you can stand up and still deliver a presentation. And what you'll find is that vocally, you know, you can breathe better, you can do more. But every time I stand and deliver, when I deliver, you know, more like keynote type presentations, people are always wowed and like, wow, the guy was standing up. And, you know, and Boris, it's a bit silly that, you know, people are impressed by the fact that I can stand on two feet. Yeah, it is. It's a very strange story. But that, that approach that you have, like, what are you doing in the normal world? Well, I stand up. Well, well. Figure it out for yourself, man. Like you are sitting at home. <laughs> like, let's repeat what you are already used to. Like let's just do it in the same way. But at home. also, but the amount of times that people then turn around and say, "Oh, but my, yeah, you know, I can't do that because my my office is set up like this, or my back bedroom is set up like this." But you know, to be able to stand up, all you need to do is raise up the level of the the screen and the camera. Yeah. Um, and look, then then you get into, well, actually, it would be good to have a lapel mic, you know, something that clips onto you. But again, I think that's a, a good, a really good investment. And look, this is not, you know, not what I'm suggesting if you're getting together with your team and there's just four of you there and you need to give them a bit of an update on, you know, how things are going. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that big, important presentation when, you, you know, you really want to impress somebody. So, yeah, um, stand and deliver is, uh, yeah, is the micro skill. Yeah. These are a lot of practical tips and tricks already. Um, Rob, what are one question before the last? Because it's already 40 minutes mm -hmm. or 35 or 40. So one question before the last related to you are exposed to so many people, you work with so many people, so many organizations. For sure, you are seeing people that like care about presentations or made an impression on you for with their presentation skills who is the people that who are the people who is the person that we need to invite on this podcast um well actually i'm going to pick up this book here so i'm going to pick up this book and uh andrew king so andrew king is a solicitor here in the uk and he's just written a book which has got 50 tips for effective video conferencing now the reason why i tell you about andy is because Andy's a solicitor. So Andy's used to being in uh, in courts and doing you know court hearings. And just before lockdown here in the UK, March of last year, he had a court hearing that was moved virtually. And um, what he did was, again, he's done a lot of that thinking that I've been talking about today. He's actually taken the ideas of, well, what would we have done? And now how do we take that virtually? So he's put together a really short, digestible book with 50 tips of how to do it. Now it's focused on the legal profession and you doing a court hearing, but you read it and you go, there's so much in there. And, you know, similar to what lots of the things we've talked about today that you can apply. So um, so why don't you see if you can get Andy Andrew King to come and join you? And what yeah, I like okay. is he's, he's not in a way from the presentation industry. You know, he's got a day job, he's a solicitor, but he's thought about this stuff. That's nice. I will definitely find his book and I recommend everyone search and find uh, Andrew's book also. So one last, where can people find you? Where can people find more about the company or connect with you? Like what is the channels or what are the channels or what is that one place where you are? Yeah, so one simple place, Boris, probably where we connect to is LinkedIn. So, you know, come and find me, Rob Geraghty, presenting virtually on LinkedIn. Um, you know, we, we um, yeah, open to connecting there on LinkedIn. The other thing that we do once every two weeks, Boris, we, we run a introductory session to presenting virtually. So you get to meet me, you get to see me face to face. 
Um, we also bring some of the other team members in and we just share some of these micro skills. And then we talk about the, the work that we do. And, you know, if you're from a large organization and want to, to bring us in-house, we can talk about that. Or if you want to come on, we run an open program called the Presenting Virtually Skills Academy. So if anyone wants to come on that program and it's just them on their own, they're an individual consultant or something, then uh, they can hear about that. But, uh, but yes, yeah, just reach out. Okay, just one last here. The videos, where can people find those? Are they on LinkedIn? Yeah, so again, I post a lot of video content on LinkedIn with ideas all around presenting virtually. Um, you know, we also have an online course, which again, people want, if they want to, see everything and see all of our uh, methodology and then they can they, they can buy that as well so but just you know as i say reach out on linkedin is a great starting place to uh, okay. to connect brilliant i wrote all of those things down and i will make sure that we put them in the show notes so that people and everyone who is listening to this one check them out okay check those things out because you are presenting virtually and you will be <laughs> you will be <laughs> presenting virtually for the next Rob, what is your estimation for the next what? How much time? How much more? Well, okay, so so and again, one of the things I do regularly on a Saturday is I run a poll on LinkedIn, and the poll I asked last Saturday, and we had 150 people reply to this, was if you could wave a magic wand and you could have your ideal split, would it be 100% um, face to face, zero virtual, or would it be somewhere in between? And what was interesting is over 75% of people shows that at least 50% of their work would be virtual. So look, virtual is not going away. We're going to have to do this. It, it, you know, it may well, it's going to be part of the mix a lot more, but I think there's such benefits there. I remember talking to the salesperson who said, I used to get in the car, drive for two hours, do a meeting for an hour and drive home. That was my day. Now I've just had four meetings all in the same day. Um, and this is the benefit of it. So um, it's not yeah. going anywhere, um, Boris. We just need to get people to get better at it because my concern is that people keep having bad experiences on virtual presentations and we're going to switch off from them and say, oh, I don't want to do that. Oh, I've got another WebEx session to go to today. And we need to make these experiences better, more professional. And if we do that, people can stand out and really differentiate themselves. Yeah. Rob, thanks for joining. Thanks for sharing all of those practical advices. Like that was super nice. We can obviously talk about this topic for hours, if not days, <laughs> if not days, maybe. But again, to everyone who is listening, if you have any questions, let us know on LinkedIn or on Facebook or on any social media platform. Platform, <laughs> I will make sure that I'll tag Rob and we'll make sure that we reply to you and help. Okay. In the meantime, you have Rob's and everything that he's doing, his LinkedIn profile, his website, link to the online course. Also visit our site, website 356labs.com and not 365labs.com to see what we are doing and how we can help you and your company write, design and deliver truly effective presentations. And do not forget Present to Succeed, our conference, the biggest presentation skills event in the world that's coming up in April. So make sure you get your ticket very, very soon. Thanks for listening. And in case you found this episode useful, subscribe to the podcast and why not even leave us a review on iTunes or share it with a friend. We would appreciate it. Thanks again and see you in the next one. Bye.